I get a million subscription offers and I don't always pick them up. And I get a bunch from the New Yorker, you know, where they let you read a couple of articles and then they say, but do you want to join for say, blah, 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 blah. And I finally blew for the New Yorker, which is the most sophisticated kind of New York Upper West Side magazine for intellectuals who like to read long articles. And it just so happens that maybe this, I guess this is why I picked it up. In July, they had the therapy issue. And I said, okay, I, I guess this is what I, I spent 60 bucks for six months. And then it automatically renews the higher rate, but that's not your problem. And so there were three articles that really hit me and I combined them and we're going to release a blog post on it. The first one is uh, we more and more think in therapeutic terms in America. That's what the article says. Everybody believes in the value of therapy. Uh, nobody would turn away from it. People refer to everything in those terms. So we're really on the same page. But there's a little bad news in there. Uh, mental health outcomes, just as you and I have discussed in regards to adolescence, have been deteriorating. Uh, and some of them are so obvious, suicides, depression rates, anxiety rates. And it's sort of like, so the article, in a way that doesn't really fully come to grips with it, says everybody believes in therapy and uh, brain science in particular. Oops, we're doing worse and worse. In my, the next part of the article says, well, let's go back to the genome. The human genome was discovered. And they thought, well, we'll find a gene for depression, a gene for schizophrenia. And pretty early on, we discovered, <laughs> well, there's no such gene. We were humbled, yes. We were humbled. But then neuroscientists never give up. And, and Bush was the one who said, well, this is the era of the brain in the 1980s, um, mm -hmm. 1980s. And they started tracing little genome and brain impulses. And what you end up with after you do that is, well, a hundred parts of the nervous system go into schizophrenia. And in some weighted way, you can calculate a likelihood of not, but you can't calculate that much. You only can calculate a minority. And you're using things that no human being can make sense of. And forgive me for saying this, the queen of that is Maya Salovitz. Maya Salovitz is smart enough to know that there are no genes for all these things, but she believes in big data. She believes, well, if you, you know, 0.16 of uh, this gene and 0.03 of that gene, if you calculate them all, you'll find out who's likely to be depressed or an addict. Yeah. And then if you ask her, she weighed, you know, 80 pounds at Columbia because she was taking heroin and cocaine. And then she went to a big rehab and she takes antidepressants. We ask, and then unlike many people who got out of rehab, she got out of rehab. She went to Brooklyn college. She became a famous writer, wrote a bestseller. And now is, you know, rich and famous. Um, if you ask her and you have asked her, you know, kind of what got you better. She'll say, well, uh, you know, I had a brain disease. It's not like some stupid gene or 12 steps. But then I took antidepressants and that enabled me to become, you know, a successful person. And you'll react to that by going, really? You really believe that, like, if somehow you took some heroin now, you'd be back in the street? So let's right. jump right. forward. Um, the person who embodies all this, the article... The article is really well written. Um, Thomas Insel was selected to be head of the NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health, in 2004 because he's Mr. Brain Psychiatry. And he had done some research like that. And he was head of the NIMH for until 2017. And when he left, he wrote a memoir and did some interviews. And I'll quickly summarize, as the article does, 
You know, we spent twenty billion dollars, and not one mental in- health indicator is improved. More people are not in recovery; fewer are. There aren't less suicides. There are more suicides, and more people are depressed rather than less. Fewer people being depressed, and so we've reached this sort of dead end. And what he's the author can't. Nobody could make this jump, which is one that you and I make. Um, the very act of resolving things into brain chemistry and diseases, that way of thinking about things, in fact, makes us more hopeless, more likely to uh, capsize under the weight of these diseases, and to be less able to do the things that enable people to progress beyond that. So, okay, so that's the largest article. And I'm, you know, it's a really long article. I don't know, 7,000 words. You know, and I I read every word. The second article is called, There's Been a Revolution in Emergency Room Treatment. And I think it's called um, EM, small EM, capital P-A-T-H. And what happens if, People have an emotional breakdown sometime. They're taken off it to an emergency room. Can you imagine going to an emergency room if you're having an emotional crisis? You go into this room with these kind of iridescent lights beaming. You're sitting in a room with a lot of, an uncomfortable room with a lot of people who are going through distress. And you're waiting to see a psychiatrist who's going to have two and a half minutes to look at you and give you. Um, medication. So this is the brilliant new approach to emergency room mental health crises. They create a separate room that's very comfortable. You know, it costs a ton of money to put somebody in emergency rooms. So if you have one big room, you can sort of get some nice furniture. You can afford to bring in, you know, have a nice food table. You can have some nice entertainment and music sections. And so that's where Empath now deals with emergency room mental crises. Now, if if you were to say to somebody, you know, why don't you take people who are really emotionally distraught and put them in a nice, comfortable environment with a few little enjoyable things, some nice food and entertainment, and where they can actually talk to each other. And the helping staff isn't psychiatrists, they're counselors or social workers who are trained somewhat in, in listening and empathy skills. And guess what? The people in empath go home quicker and more resolved than the people who are stuck in an emergency room for eight hours to see a psychiatrist for two and a half minutes. And their long-term outcomes are better. This is just an example of something that we say time and time again. Well, let's just sort of think what we know as human beings. (laughs) Doesn't that kind of make sense? Wouldn't I rather go into a room and have some, you know, guacamole and listen to some of my favorite music with some nice uh, uh, earphones? And maybe talk to somebody very nice who asks me a little bit about my problems. I get to talk them through a little bit. And then the third article I read was how the media have changed from how they depict therapy. It used to be people didn't even know what therapy was. So they talk about the Sopranos. Tony Soprano sees his therapist. So for a lot of people, that's how they learned about therapy. And similar kinds of programs. And then they talk about how therapy programs have changed now. They're more realistic in some ways and less realistic. And then they mentioned Ted Lasso in this our third article. It's a bunch of me. It's like written by three media critics. And in a way, they're disparaging of it. They say, well, Ted Lasso isn't a therapy program. Ted Lasso is a program about how being hopeful and optimistic makes people feel better and have fewer mental disabilities and makes the whole team play together better. Mm. So there's a whole article about that. 
that sort of throws in Ted Lasso, which is not a therapy program. So let me summarize for those people who don't have time or the uh, money to buy the a subscription. And these are three long articles. Here are the five things that they've learned. I'm going to summarize for you. Number one is, despite $20 billion and more investment in brain science and great new techniques for therapy, all indicators are mental health is deteriorating in America. Mind you. Um, okay. Um, the number two thing is, um, and that, that's represented by, by Thomas Insult. And the specific thing the article begins with is COVID. The general rap is after COVID, mental health deteriorated as for the entire nation even further. So the data weren't good coming in, but now people are even more isolated and separated. So the second deduction is even if we did have really great techniques that worked, which we didn't, if something happens like a drought or an epidemic and all of those good things are erased, well, then you have nothing. You don't go in to be treated for pneumonia or cancer and they make progress. And then you go outside and it's a cold day and you relapse right away. Then you have nothing. So that's the second point. Whatever good they claim to have done, it was totally not resilient. Um, then the th third thing to come out of all of this is, you know, they came up with a crazy new way of dealing with emotional crises in em emergency rooms. They treated people nice in a nice, pleasant environment. And they talked to them, and people did better. Oh, my God. <laughs> Where did they come up with that? So uh, I, I forget what point I'm up to now. Maybe point four, um, which is just making use of the common sense things that we know about in life is the best pathway to understanding and helping people. And what this all amounts to is disregarding that in favor of these mechanistic answers, which have been scientifically proven not to work, the genetic solution, uh, whatever kind of brain theory cures they're coming, or treatments they're coming up with, does not discourage us from continuing down that path despite sign after sign that what works best is on the one hand, a practical, helpful, nice, kind communication and support with one last thing thrown in from some crazy uh, show about a soccer team, Ted Lasso, that hope and inspiration are perhaps the most critical elements in all of this improvement. And so uh, if those people get a chance to see your and my discussion about adolescent depression and how individuals versus institutions react to that, we're saying the same thing once again. The practical things that make sense somehow seem to be cast aside in favor of these fancy scientific sounding things that don't make sense and don't work. And our plea is that in the Life Process Program, what we try to do, what we do, the Life Process Program means, let's take the basic elements of people's lives, their work, their play, uh, their intimate relationships, who they get along with, who they spend time with, their entertainments. And if we build those into positives, and then we generalize those into feelings of hopefulness and meaning, and capability of the individual, those are the ways you get the best mental health and addiction outcomes. So hopefully I saved you the price of subscription to the New Yorker. We read, I can see the title, we read the new New Yorker series so that you didn't have to. 
Excellent.